uh, innovation was only spontaneous, you can't plan it, then what do you think about uh, these companies? Uh, you know, all great innovators. And just a disclaimer here, uh, NPC I didn't ask me to put their logo here. This is actually a, a real, uh, I would regard as one of the most innovative companies in the world. Reason being, you have the uh, UPI, Enash, APS, BBPS, Bharat QR, uh, all are examples that the world should follow and world is following. Uh, I have done a, a, a lot of study on how uh, Australia, the uh, NTP platform, uh, and also the, the new age payment platform in Singapore has worked, but nothing is as convenient and as easy to implement and out of the world kind of an experience as uh, UPI. So these are innovators and how do they continuously, you know, uh, you know, come up with these brilliant ideas. So there must be some kind of a process uh, behind it. It's not just a spontaneous idea, right? So that is basically the whole uh, uh, point that I wanted to uh, put across. So this is the, the, the sentence that I always thought innovation was. So this is my own sentence, which says innovation is seeing a problem that everyone else has seen, but solving it in a way that nobody else has solved. But later, after you know seeing the examples that people are coming out, I was quickly corrected by Oxford uh, Dictionary, which says in innovation is nothing but introduction of new things, new ideas, and new ways of doing something. So there's no concept of you know a problem or anything in this particular sentence, and it's just clean this is what innovation is right uh, so let's look at some quick statistics on on innovation 95 percent of products uh, uh, product innovations fail that's a staggering number that which basically means five percent only succeed but despite that uh, if you see there is um, innovate there is a number which says innovative companies have 11 percent additional revenue and 22 percent additional EBITDA compared to uh, companies that don't. So uh, uh, by the way, all these numbers that you see on the screen are from reputed uh, consulting firms, uh, including my alma mater, which is McKinsey and Company. Uh, so this is uh, there's another insight which says 84% executives say that um, you know innovation is uh, important to their growth strategy. And uh, only about 6% actually are satisfied with the innovation performance, which means there's a huge potential, there's a huge opportunity and uh, the, uh, to, to innovate and bring out the best of the companies. Now, let's look at some, uh, go through some quick theory, if I could say that. Um, first, let's see what differentiates innovative companies. So there are basically five things that differentiates uh, and that is what is being depicted here. One is empowerment. Now, what is empowerment? Uh, innovative companies empower their employees to innovate. So you are allowed to fail and rewarded for attempting. This is what uh, differentiates a leading innovator, co innovative company compared to others. Uh, others, maybe if you try to do something new, you'll, you'll probably be uh, questioned twice. Why did you do it differently? And also training is a major uh, factor contributing to this. It's not just technical skills, but also soft skills to uh, make you think out of the box, to challenge the invisible um, you know, uh, uh, orthodoxes and also harness the unprecedented trends. So design thinking, incidentally, is also one of the skills that can actually be taught. And I'm sure Ganeshan uh, would uh, go through it in depth in his uh, session uh, after this. So that's about empowerment. Next, uh, let's look at define. So what is define? It's basically successful companies um, have a well-defined structure uh, that is followed for innovation. For example, they do have innovation uh, or idea banks. Uh, they do allow for billable times to innovate. There are re rewards and recognition around innovations, etc. cetera. Uh, there are also metrics uh, defined very clearly by you know, leading innovative companies. Uh, this is uh, another important factor. And uh, it's not just about creating a winning proposition for them. It's about creating a unique proposition. So success or failure is not an important metrics that is measured. So that's an important thing to note. And uh, uh, yeah, so then, um, uh, of course, after metrics, there is uh, leadership, uh, leadership combined with um, culture. Let me just remove this. Yeah. So, so uh, leadership and uh, command with cultures. So now, uh, you know, leadership. Do I need to speak about it? Strong leadership and great value system. It's like a no-brainer. But the question is: um, Is the organization doing enough to build this leadership skill? 
is the culture supportive and that's a big question and uh, this is what is clearly defined in leading uh, innovative organizations of course the processes uh, innovative uh, you know innovation management process is quite critical and that is what we'll uh, quickly look at in the next slide uh, innovation management so which is basically the six steps uh, it is not rocket science it's pretty straightforward uh, it all starts with enlightening wow it's a heavy word uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, it essentially is about lightening the sense of curiosity in employees' minds. Um, we actually, uh, you know, in the previous slide, we did discuss uh, about it a little bit. Uh, it's, uh, it's only that the curious minds innovate, uh, rest just follow. So you need to have a, a, a team of people who are curious, who are, uh, you know, having that innovation stride in them. So that's the first, problem, first part, enlightening people's mind. And then capturing the ideas. So ideas, I would say, is basically a filtered collection of curious thoughts. Now, capture them, uh, articulate them in detail. And uh, this idea could be anything. Uh, it could start from basically an unfulfilled requirement for a particular product that you're building, or a problem that is worth solving for, uh, an initiative um, that can save you a potload of money, um, maybe some, an idea which will help you capture a new market, or just a new technical solution. So there are uh, various ideas, categories that you can just capture, uh, crowdsource the ideas. Once that's done, the next is basically filter and prioritize. Uh, this is a crucial phase. This is where a great idea may be nipped at the bud and uh, it may fail even before it is attempted to build. The reason being, uh, this is where you, you filter out the good ideas to the bad. And this is a phase that actually requires, uh, needs to be curated by an experienced eye. So uh, only experienced people can actually understand the potential of good ideas. So that's, that's basically the filtering of you know, the whole idea. And then comes the structuring, uh, or I would say the R&D phase. Um, so ideas are great, but uh, is it feasible? Right? That's an important question that you need to uh, also answer. So what's the best way to implement a particular solution? What are the support system that's, uh, uh, that needs to be made available? Uh, who can you approach to go live quickly? And what are the different ways? So this is basically what is covered in structuring. So once you filter out, the filtered ideas actually go through the whole process of structuring. And then comes marketing. And interestingly, marketing, if you see, is coming before even the solution is uh, going live. Now here, uh, because it's an innovative idea, this is a new proposition that you're going to launch in the market. You will need to test the product uh, before, the, test the idea before you actually go live. So for example, get to know the product sentiments, uh, what do they say? Uh, what do they have to say? Is is it um, is there any quick change that you can make to the product uh, to make it more attractive, or um, how should you position the product in the uh, during the launch? So these are quite important insights that you can get um, uh, in this particular phase, wherein you approach your potential customers, uh, a, a set of uh, people to just take reviews, feedbacks, and uh, get it going. And then, of course, the solution phase this is the final stage where the solution is actually launched. And uh, then you you essentially pray to be one of the lucky 5% who, who actually succeed. So that's uh, essentially the whole innovation management life cycle in, in a quick uh, you know, five minutes introduction. Now, there are heaps of tools available for you to manage it. If you're an individual uh, working on your own ideas, uh, the best tool out there in the market, uh, it's called MS Excel. Uh, of course, other than Excel, there's also SharePoint, there's Jira, et cetera, which are standard tools, nothing specifically built for innovation. But there are also innovation management tools uh, uh, also available in the market, interestingly. So they are called AHA or Crowdicity, et cetera. You actually look up on, the, on, on Google, you'll find like you know, 20 such uh, solutions, which are quite su uh, successful as well. So essentially, the, the, the theme of most of these products are crowdsourcing and uh, idea filtration, and rest is basically the product lifecycle management. So that's essentially the, the whole innovation uh, you know, management. Now, Another question to you. So, if do you think that you know just following these steps, uh, investing uh, the whole lot of money in buying tools and you know building these idea banks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, do you think uh, it will make you successful? Um, will an, a company be uh, able to launch an amazing product into the market by just doing the, these 
six steps um, strictly? Well, the answer uh, really is no. Um, so there is actually an interesting HBR article. I would actually uh, recommend you to read it. So you can just search for uh, the right way to spend your innovation budget, uh, hbr.org, which is the Harvard Business Review. Uh, so they've got a, a pretty neat article where they also have three lessons um, for innovation. But uh, I'll not get into that, uh, but just to touch upon. Uh, so let's speak about these two famous companies, Kodak and um, Xerox, right? Now, Kodak, um, during the initial days of um, you know digital cameras and when uh, the real cameras were dying, actually spent $4 billion, it's $4 billion, uh, developing a, a digital camera. So they, they put all of their money to build a good uh, you know digital product, a digital camera, uh, and they ticked all the boxes of you know a good innovation management um, you know strategy should follow. But um, uh, they just the one one thing that they did a blunder on is they did not develop a new business model. So they stuck to their old business model. So essentially, which basically means that it failed to convert uh, uh, into a good solution. So the problem there, uh, as HBR uh, review also highlights, is that uh, it failed to convert what is known as an innovation capacity into an innovation ability. Uh, the definition is very clearly put here. Uh, capacity is basically investing, putting all the money into it, and uh, ability is basically getting customer feedback, uh, building new customer experiences, revised uh, business models, etc. So Kodak failed to convert its uh, innovation capacity, which is a $4 billion investment into an innovation ability. Let's look at this other interesting company, Xerox. Now, uh, Xerox, you may not know, uh, actually was the original inventor of the whole concept of icons, icons that you see on your laptop, on your mobile phones as well, was originally invented by Xerox. Even the concept of Windows or even point and click on the mouse, uh, even local area network, the LAN network was actually invented by Xerox long, long time ago. But it's lo it lost its innovation stride in between. It just uh, disappeared as a company uh, because it moved uh, from what it was doing best to into a business uh, which is a uh, copier business. Uh, but later uh, in 2000, um, uh, in late 2010 or so, they started to uh, look at the second aspect, which is the innovation ability. So in 2011, actually two thirds of uh, Xerox's revenue came from products or services that it had introduced in the last two years, to two third. So, which is basically uh, what they did is they listened to their customers and they took feedback, which is an important step for any company to, to succeed. All, all all leading innovative companies actually continuously take feedback and improve their uh, their products. So Amazon is another great example. Um, so it 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 was uh, it is still a giant retailer, but it also listened to the needs of um, you know technology players uh, for a need for a, a cloud based solution, and then it built it. And today, 52% of its income comes from AWS. So it's not just about investment into innovation but also about the whole execution and working for the customer's delight, which actually matters a lot. And that is what differentiates success versus um, a non, not so successful company. Now uh, let's move a little closer home. Uh, a quick trivia to all of you. Um, can you guess this particular company? I'll just go one by one. It's a company that started its operation in uh, India in 1901. In uh, 1946, it was incorporated as a private company. 1985 is when it was taken over by its current owners. In recent years, uh, this powerful icon started to feel the pinch, stiff competition, changing market dynamics, and deteriorating revenues. 2017 is when it reinvented itself with a fresh product offering that changed its fate. Uh, any answers? Yes, Samir God has got it. It is um, it is Saregama. Uh, so Saregama uh, uh, essentially. Um, so so who would have imagined uh, in the age of you know digital music a retro style radio would actually sell like hotcakes? So it's the implementation and the right research, right targeting of audience, and uh, the perfect product design with no complex menu 
uh, is what helped it succeed. Uh, they listened to what customer had to say. Uh, they kept it simple and they knew what they were doing. So RPG, which is the Goenka group, uh, took over um, from HMB uh, a long time back. And they saw that in the recent days with uh, you know Apple Music or Amazon Music or uh, all the other online companies, the, the CD sellers or the cassettes were really uh, disappearing from the market and they lost the market share as well. But they did have a rich heritage. So what uh, was their innovation to basically repackage their rich heritage into a new bottle? Uh, they took help from uh, some uh, uh, you know great leaders like um, Avinash Madhulia from uh, Ghana, Ghana.com, and they helped uh, these. The team helped compile a list of 5,000 most popular numbers based on data. It was purely data driven uh, from multiple sources, of course, and they uh, packaged into a beautiful retro style player. Now, Karma uh, helped Saregama double its income in three years between 2016 and 19, and uh, they're selling over a million pieces. Uh, of this particular very simple uh, music player uh, in the market. And they continue with the innovation. So in the COVID time, um, you, I'm not sure if you've seen their uh, new article, they're launching a new innovative program to you know, uh, even sell uh, their products. So they're essentially using plumbers, uh, electricians, and uh, uh, construction guys to actually sell their, their product to the end customer. A very innovative strategy is um, what they're following, and they've been pretty successful so far. So that was Saregama. So let's now, uh, you know, finally, this is uh, uh, this is essentially the last slide. Um, now, innovative companies is good, but as an individual, um, you know. Can we share some quick tips on you know, how to harvest uh, or harness your innovations, uh, innovative stride? So one is uh, the first point, of course, is that you know great ideas have a curse, and what is that curse? It's basically that it comes to the inventor's mind only for a short period and vanishes quickly. So that's basically the curse. So uh, one thing is always remember to capture the idea before it vanishes and make sure it is detailed because devil is always in the detail. So uh, one tip is capture the idea as it as and when it comes. Keep a notebook on your in your in your pocket or technology tools, for example, Google Keep, Evernote, etc., are amazing tools. So you can access it from your desktop. You can access it from your mobile as well. Uh, they have some cool nifty features um, which helps you to do that. So for example, tagging uh, is is a great concept there, uh, wherein you can actually tag your idea, saying, you know, this is the idea to change the world, or this is an idea that will make me rich. This is an idea that will, you know, get get me a promotion, or this is an idea that will look make me look cool in front of my fiance, or whatever, right? You know, tag it, tag those ideas so that you can always fetch it, uh, look up, and uh, ponder over it. So next uh, tip is always discuss these ideas with your friends and family. So get feedback and ratification. Don't hide it to yourself. Don't shy away uh, thinking that somebody will steal it. Because the more you discuss, the more uh, you know uh, the idea unravels. So the more uh, additional idea you get, or the challenges that you can forecast, and uh, you know solutions for some of the challenges also come in when you when you discuss this with friends and family. And of course, uh, the last point is customer feedback is good. So do listen to your customer. But sometimes, you know, uh, go with your gut feel. Because, you know, once uh, the famous uh, um, Henry Ford said uh, that uh, I had, if I had asked uh, what people wanted, they would have said faster horses. Because this is the time when you know, people were using horses and uh, Ford invented uh, the T uh, model and then uh, uh, the cars became a rage. So it's a very good uh, you know, point to ponder about saying you know, customer feedback is good, but sometimes you know, your, your own gut feel is what is more important, uh, and that's what you need to listen to. So on that note, um, I would um, thank you. Thanks a lot for listening. I would now want to hand over the, the uh, next part of the discussion to Ganesan. Uh, so he would now... I think he will discuss it. He will just introduce himself. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Sandesh. So uh, Ganeshan, as we discussed, he will cover uh, more on the aspects of design thinking. 
and um, Ganeshan, are you able to share? Yeah, great. We can't hear you. Can you just? Hey, uh, hey, Ashutosh, I am back. Yeah, sure. Over to you. Thanks, Anish. That was a very good. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks NCPA for this opportunity. Uh, am I audible, Ashutosh? Ashutosh, am I audible? Yeah, audible. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks, Andesh. That's That was a great session because I think you've laid a platform for, for me to make my session a little bit more interesting uh, because um, you've also covered a little portion of how design thinking plays a good role in innovation. So with that, good afternoon all. Um, hope all of you are safe. And I think that's the new normal now. We start, we start off with not even good afternoon. We start saying all of you are safe. So uh, I'm Ganeshan. I'm a design director at IBM with over 20 plus years of experience in the space of design. So I've been in the, all the forms of design, uh, starting from filmmaking to um, artistic work, to user interface design, to print media, uh, visual arts, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know whether I'm a jack of all and good in none. That's something you will have to judge today. But overall, it has been a great journey for me. So I think today my topic is design thinking. So before I get into design thinking, um, you can keep continue uh, posting your questions in the Q&A in the chat, and I'll take all your questions at, at the end of the session. Uh, in case, uh, Ashras, I just want to help you out. In case I'm not audible, uh, in case I'm fast, please, Ashutosh, I would like you to represent the audience and uh, see whether you could control me or hint, give a hint, Ganeshan, slow down a bit. Okay, I'll stop and take a breather before I go to the next slide. So before I talk or get into design thinking, I was just thinking, should we go a little bit step back and get to understand how the, the word design thinking came into picture. So I just am going to take the first few minutes on going back to history or geography, whatever you call it. And I want to touch base on something called arts. This is something which is very familiar with most, most of you. You would have touched arts at some point of the time in your childhood or in your teens or during your college in some form. It could be anything. It could be cooking, it could be reading, it could be drawing, painting, it could be playing the game, anything. So what is art? Is art something which has been come in the recent times? I don't think so. It's been there for ages. It has been, been for centuries. Might be with different names, different forms, and different uh, representations. We are going to look at what are diff a quick uh, glimpse as what are the different kind of arts that is available and how that dwells into the other areas and we end up in design thinking. There are multiple definitions I went through, but one interesting definition which I've highlighted in yellow, which really captivated me is, art is an expression of our thoughts. It's about our thoughts and emotions, feelings, desires, and what we see in the day-to-day -day life, right? So how do you relate arts to? I think we are very familiar with uh, Aishma and Kurana, whom we consider him as a very good actor, or uh, the sitar maestro Pandit uh, Ravi Shankar, or tabla maestro Zakir Hussain, or a classic performance, a classic player like Ravid. If you take every space, there will be an artist there. And who is an artist? Who is the, who, who, the, the person who starts working from his heart? I think the word art, I feel, has come from the heart. Right? That's how, how I see art says. So that's why it talks about emotions, intuitions, thoughts, and desires, right? So these people, yes, they entertain the crowd, they make people happy, but they perform for their own. That's why they're called artists. And they have got, they themselves have a very uh, interesting personality around them, right? From here, I like to move into what are the various arts? You call you divide arts into multiple forms. You call it as a visual arts, which is more what you see, what you feel. There are literary arts, people who write books, novels, uh, even the, the people in the press, they all write, right? They are, that's, a, that's a literary art. Performing art, it could be drama, music, dance, singing, 
and then we come where human perform it, okay, where humans are involved in it. Whereas in visual arts, though human do it, but it's beyond human. You start looking into different forms like architecture, photography, sculpture, painting, drawing, and so on. And then we come to an applied art is what is going to lead us to the next screen or the next slide, which is going to be a connect. Applied art is nothing but, I'll like give you what is an applied art. It is more about how we deal with a lot of objects. We lead with a lot of points. We come across a lot of objects, a lot of points in our day-to-day -day life. Are they usable? Are they functional? And we use it every day and keep saying, are they are? What is happening? This is not working. This is not happening well. I am not able to use this knob. The switch is problem. What that leads to? They're all, they might be artistically beautiful, but do they make any sense? Do they make any um, make your life easy? So that's where the applied art comes in, which is slowly branching out to the space of design. So applied art covers product design, industrial design, commercial arts, all these things you would have seen. You would have seen in the at home uh, how the furniture uh, making uh, furniture have been made, the car has been designed, or the utensils have been created. These are all coming in the form of applied arts. Now this is logically going to lead me to the next slide, which is going to go to design. As you say, as I was mentioning, art is coming from heart. This is my own uh, definition. I might be right or wrong. I don't know. But design, if you see, um, there is a different uh, meaning in Latin. It, it's, it's something called as a designer. Okay? It it's comes from the Latin word designer. The word design, I personally feel, has a science added to it, a process added to it, a analogy added to it. If you add a certain amount of science to art, in art, in an artist, he doesn't think much. He thinks, but he thinks from multiple perspectives. He thinks from his perspective to create something. Design is also creation, but it is not creating for us. We are trying to create for something else or someone else. So of all the definition, the one I like the most, I think uh, this has been, uh, I've seen this in many of the IBM presentations. It is intent behind an outcome. So that is a very clear case of how you design. You can design your life. You can design your house. You can design your family. You can design your travel, right? So design is a much more bigger terminology than art. Now, the next question that would come to you is, is art and design the same? There's a lot of art in design, but the, I will not agree with the vice versa because artists create the thing. Not it can by it, it can become a design, but it is not with an intent to do that. It comes creatively. It comes from inner side. That is design. Now this design, multiple facets which you have seen in the in your day to day life, lighting design, user interface design. I think we are all in the information technology. Packaging, game design, interior design, fashion design, so, uh, sound design, and so on. There's quite a lot of design. And all these things, what you see in the space of design, have artistic element inside, but they have been designed with an intent for a particular outcome. If I have to design a, a, what do you call a, a tap, it will be artistic, but it has been done with the intention, with an intent to see whether I can get a water out or can I close it? How do I close it? How can I make it more fun usable, more than functional? It, just, it was functional uh, years back. Now it has become more usable. You would say, Are, are it is not using at all. I'm, it's, I'm not getting the experience. Something you will keep making the statements in a day to day life. That's exactly where design is leading towards design thinking now i think the word design thinking is a highly used word in today's context and it has been widely used now this is the way how how i feel things have evolved and i would even say the earlier version of design thinking was creative thinking there's a there's a thin line between creative thinking and design thinking creative thinking is a little bit more unstructured open fluid 
it is scalable but design thinking is more process oriented that's a process it is methodical it's it is more structured and it is more human centered in an art it is human centered but the artist does not create with an intent to intend to satisfy the human but by chance it's the certain segment of people get happy with the program or something but in design you create a product you create an element you create a service with a clear intent that the human is satisfied that is human centered approach but very interesting element of design thinking which i look at is it can solve a problem or it can generate a new idea so i give a very uh, a usual example i give in most of my sessions are if I'm a popper i am a let us say ganesh is a beggar and i want to make sure that i am having one square meal a day i can use design thinking i have a one square meal a day and i want to go for a simple house to buy so that i am not in the road in a small house i can use design thinking from a single bedroom house i want to go for a palatial house i can still use design thinking so it is just not to solve a problem we keep talking about problem yes it is for solving a problem but it is also beyond solving a problem it is also to you can generate ideas and that's exactly sandesh was talking how this can be used on innovation how it can be used in innovation it's a very interesting tool for innovation okay so with this i would like to move on to the next stage of evolution now okay ganeshan you are talking about design art design thinking now where where was all this before yes we used to go to a program see an artist perform go to a painting now all of a sudden why is the design come into picture is it because steve jobs brought in mac or xerox came in with those icons is that the case i think we need to also correct ourselves that design thinking or creative thinking or design these are not these are not uh, various uh, spaces which has come in after 1990s or 2000 or suddenly it has come into picture it has been there in the industry but it has been not brought to light because of various other factors i don't think we need to get into that so i just want to touch base on what the recent design thinking evolution might be i'm picked up from 1969 because that's the time where i was born so might be it's very close to my heart i don't know so it started off with something called way of thinking it was done by herb simon okay and then it moved on in somewhere in 1980 at stanford you will see the model stanford model which is a very famous model where they came out with the concept of design thinking in 1980 i think uh, david kelly had been working uh, during that period in stanford and he along with uh, rolf rast and mckens they came out with a concept of design thinking and that concept of the design thinking model was used both mostly for product design uh, industrial design and it was kept to a certain areas only it was not opened up somewhere in 1990 when we had the uh, information technology boom came up and that's precisely where david kelly uh, he's the ideo founder one of the top uh, design agencies in the world he came out and started off um, came out with the, that process and started using it for the information technology space and that's exactly where i know it it comes in it changes the world right it brings in more uh, popularity and that's the way i feel design thinking has become more popular among in the last 10 years or 5 years it has this word design thinking has caught up uh, uh, heavily and it has become like it's, it's become raving nowadays okay so i just thought i should talk about this a little bit before we move to design thinking ashutosh let me know if i'm going slow so that we can keep up the time is yeah, it so right uh ganesh we have around 10 minutes now okay great i will run through this okay so why do we need this i just want to splash few statistics in front of you to mention uh the statistics actually is not a recent statistics it's pretty old but i wantonly picked up the statistics to tell you that few years back if this has been the statistics what could have been the statistics that could happen today now a companies that foster creativity 1.5 times have a greater market share imagine this is not today's data what could be today's data i want you to all to imagine that how much design thinking has had an impact on the people i want to also talk to you about the 46% in the last about 
where people who do not follow design thinking model or a design model, their outcomes are much weaker or on par. That's why you see uh, design thinking being one of the key element of these kind of webinars, right? And design-led firms have always made sure that the people working environment has been great. It has been more, uh, it has been more, uh, what do you call, customer-centric. And also, it has also brought in the concept of uh, earlier innovation was kept to certain areas. Now, I think thanks to design and design thinking, innovation has become part and parcel of every person because it's become your uh, one of your uh, Taraka mantra that, hey man, you have to be innovative, right? I think these have complemented one another and also helped in uh, taking things forward. I think I feel it's it's all on the positive side. Now, there are a few design-driven companies which uh, been there. For example, Apple is one of the leading one. Uh, Xerox was one, was already mentioned. We had IBM. I think uh, Nui, uh, the ex um, head of PepsiCo, has always been mentioning about how I'm thinking has to be a forefront, it should be a leader. Then Nike, Amazon, Google. And also, on the, uh, if you start looking at uh, the payment segment, that is a financial segment, there are quite a lot of companies, Apple Pay, uh, you have got the Amazon Pay, and Paytm really stands, uh, stands tall with respect to the kind of innovation they have come out with. Uh, they are a design-led company. They use a lot of design uh, elements, the way how they perform. And I don't need to talk about Google Pay. Uh, it could be um, it could be Swiggy's, the Zomatos. Uh, you can call call any of the new startups, um, Urban Ladder, uh, anybody. Okay, they all form. They all follow the design way. It's, I won't say it is design-led technology or technology-leading design. I think design and technology are hand in hand to move forward, to make experiences, um, people's uh, uh, enablement for people, innovation makes seamless and easy for everybody. It is on both sides, both from the customer side, as well as from the, uh, what do you call, the organization front. As I move forward, there has been clear in this space, right? Now, where did these disruptors come from? It's not that IBM is not a disrupt disruptor or um, uh, what do you call, um, uh, Apple is not a disruptor. At that point of time, they were a disruptor or Microsoft. Everybody has been a disruptor, but there are people who are disruptors in a very short span of time. They came in and they just broke upon everything like IKEA, Airbnb, I think Uber, you create this, yeah, that's, that's a card uh, which is uh, making life much more easier for card payment. But I want to look at the left-hand side corner, rent the runaway. It's a very interesting, I think it's in Europe, where I don't need to use a wardrobe, right? Uh, I just need to walk into a shop, use a particular dress, hire it for a week, and walk away. See the thought process that has come in, the way how Airbnb have come in. So these kind of disruptors, where did they all come from? Okay, some, there has been some process. I'm not uh, marketing design thinking. There should some, be some framework or a process or a model which has really helped things to craft, uh, bring in this kind of thought process coming in, right? Now, there are clear benefits here, right? It energizes employees. I think that's very important. It energizes humans. It gives better customer delight, right? And rest is okay. And it, it, it's an iterative model. It keeps changing again. For me, very important is the people who are working, it makes them happy. The people who are receiving the services, the customers, makes them happy, right? The rest are all fine. They get solutions, speed, reduce costs, minimize risk. These are all fine, but these are the two elements because at the both, both the sides, we are human. Actually, at the end of the day, we are all human, right? Technology helps the human. So those are the two points which I want to highlight here. Now, with this, I would like to move into what are the popular design thinking model or a framework or a process, okay? Some people call it as model, some people call it as process and framework. I was talking about this is a very popular model they follow. And this is, I would say, one of the uh, uh, models which came into industry at an earlier stage. And then around 2004, uh, we had a design council's diamond model, which is also a very popular model. And we have the IBM loop model. Uh, it, they had the version one, which was uh, following the honeycomb model of Stanford. And then since they were in the information technology and they had a lot of discussions, then they brought in the loop model. 
Now, what is common in all that models are the way how the model is constructed could be a little bit different, which is for the need of what the particular industry or the particular segment or a sector or a domain requires. But the fundamental element is all about oh, how do I create an idea? How do I solve a problem? What is the process I need to take through? That is exactly what design thinking is all about. There is a process that we go through. The process is what I am going to talk in the next five minutes. Uh, uh, Ashutosh, what's the time now? I want another five minutes time to go. Yeah, you have. You have. Great. So I also want to touch base on a case study. If you can give me another two, three minutes, and then I'll close it and I'll open it for questions. Now. I would like to fold, uh, focus on the Stanford model, um, which is also the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the, uh, I won't call it this original model. It is, it is the one of the oldest models. So I would like to take that up. So basically it starts with a six honeycomb, that is six uh, hexagon, right? If I'm right, hexagon. So it starts off with understanding the problem. We call something called empathize. Then we move towards defining then you ideate, you prototype and test. The words are very simple, straightforward, nothing new. But when you say empathize, what do you mean by empathy? The empathy is nothing but, is it same as sympathy? Uh, no. Sympathy is where you feel sorry for a person. Whereas empathy is you start thinking from that person. That's a very clear cut definition, right? We never we always sympathize with a lot of people, but have you ever thought about a person? When we see a beggar on the road and you give him 10 rupees, we sympathize and give him 10 rupees. That is sympathy. He is taking care of one day's food. The empathy is, how can I solve this prob daily food problem over a period of time? And that is empathy. And that is the key element of any design thinking process. You as uh, organization, you as a developer, you as a designer, an architect, and anybody who's, defined, who, who's designing a product, who's designing a service, need to start looking at it from the user angle. That's why I said it's human centric. It's all about human. So how do what do we do in empathy? We talk to the stakeholders. We talk to the live users. We do a lot of groundwork. We do secondary research. We do primary research. It, I, I'm using these terminologies. I know this is for few, might be for many or few. It might sound, what are these terminologies? Or somebody would be familiar, but I, I can't get more in detail into it. But at a high level, we do a lot of research, study, understand what could be the problem, what could be the issue, what could be the pain points, what could be the expectation, what could be the need. And then there could be a main problem, and we can redefine or refine or define a problem. Once we define a problem, we start creating an aura of user groups. They are my target user groups. And we pick up a few personas. Uh, a simple example of persona I always give is Gabar Singh. Right? Gabar Singh is not the person who is existing. He's a fictitious person. Now, he, uh, uh, Javed Akhtar and uh, what do you call uh, Salim Javed, would have, they would have gone to Salim Javed, they would have gone to uh, uh, Chambal Valley. They would have seen multiple decades. They would have picked up elements of him and created a person called Gabbar Singh. So the similar way in our user group, we'll pick up one person who's a fictitious person, understand what is on, ban, his personality is, what is pain points, extra, and create a persona. And that persona, it could be one person or multiple persona, and that persona becomes the point for which you're going to solve the problem. And he will traverse along with you to the entire project. It just not stops with design testing, it will all go with development testing. And then you start getting into a concept of ideation. And you normally do it in the form of a workshop. It's not necessary. You can do a full-fledged workshop. You can also do a, a part-level workshop where you have a workshop or a one-day workshop or a three-day workshop. You can have a mother workshop and then cut it down to a smaller workshop. These are all very flexible, right? But the elements that is going to come in each of the workshops are the activities or the methodology or the methods. Are, this is the one. Then once you start defining the problem, you start getting into ideation. There are a couple of steps there also before you get to ideation. We start thinking, what could the current scenario is? What is the various stages of the current scenario? And each of the areas, what are the opportunities that is available? And then we start getting towards solving a problem. One important element I want to mention here is, these are various uh, methods or activities we perform over a period of in a design thinking model. 
we make it a point that we fail early to succeed later. And there's a lot of convergent and divergence, open crocodile, close crocodile. I think we use this very much in our kids. I think when we say greater than, lesser than, they say this now. So it's very common here. So we used to diverge and converge. There are times where we diverge and we start converging together. And that's exactly how we start uh, failing early we start correcting ourselves and it's an iterative process. It keeps going in a loop. If you see the earlier screen, it goes or diamond again, it's all connected. It keeps going and coming. And uh, design is also an iterative model. It doesn't mean that we release it only after we reach, there's a famous saying that you can't take bath until the ocean, uh, the sea stops, right? You have to take bath in between, come back again, correct yourself and start improving. That's exactly what we do in design thinking also. So, uh, with this, I just want to quickly uh, move on to an interesting case study uh, where uh, this is a pretty old case study, but recently they have come out with a new uh, concept, which is designed to be some, friend, some in Hong Kong, not HSBC, it's pay me. So they had a very clear problem that uh, people in Hong Kong, they were the people were using, yes, 53% respondents felt that they have to go cashless, uh, but the majority of the people, most of the residents felt that they are preferring paying in cash. Okay, that's another problem. That was one of the problem which they tried to solve at a bigger level. There was also another problem that people were gathering around uh, multiple uh, social gathering with multiple friends. And then they started looking at, uh, uh, I finished my food, then how do I transfer money? I can go and ask some money, please give me the money, uh, uh, start paying for me. That was another smaller problem they had. So you have uh, mother problem, you have children, child problem, and et cetera, okay? So the approach they took overall, be it the smaller problem or the bigger problems, they recruited thousands of people, practically not possible, but they have done it. But they recruit people who are going to be your sample customers or could be live customers. You ask them to live with them with you as you start moving towards a design and development. We constantly start correcting, updating, rectifying, refining our design. And that's exactly what has been done. And you could see the kind of data. This is a very old data, what they've got. They had the 2 million uh, customers when they released uh, Paytm in 2000, uh, say Pay Me in 2017. I just want you to uh, understand what has been an impact of this of this particular uh, uh, pay me app, uh, what impact it has brought in to the organization as well as to the customers on the clients. And uh, Nico is a customer experience lead at HSBC and these are his statements. Don't try to tackle very large challenge at once. Take small, small, small pieces and start applying this uh, framework or model. Let's try to start correcting it. Thereby you can achieve a big, we can solve bigger problems. That's a very interesting statement I saw here. I don't mind going back to the slide. Okay. The next slide which I really like uh, in this one, uh, the statement you need to start thinking about building small design community. I think that's very important. What happens is we feel design community are only designers, right? Developers, architects, salespeople, purchase people. Everybody can be formed into design community because every inputs, and that's very important, which I think I missed. It is all, design thinking is all about diverse, empowered team. As you have diverse customers outside, we also have diverse, empowered team inside. That is what is going to make it a big success. So Ashutosh, should I stop or should I continue? Yeah, I think uh, we should take two, three uh, questions and then uh, because of the time we will- uh, Okay, I understand I have to, this. there's a lot more, but I have to abrupt. Yeah, yeah, I have realized that these topics are too vast and uh, yeah. Just being an introductory session, uh, this being an introductory session, we will yeah. not expand that. Like so, yeah, exactly. definitely we will cover it in the subsequent session. Thanks. thanks for uh, thanks, Ashutosh, and thanks every at NCPI to give me this opportunity. I'm ready to take so, your questions. Yeah, so thanks, thanks. So, I'll, I'll start the question with I think you can put the same screen. No issues. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you can stop sharing. No okay. So, thank um, you. Sandesh, I want to start with you. So the first question, which I want to ask uh, from your side that how the individual understand that how it's time to innovate and how can they start their innovation journey? So if you can guide some of the steps to not only the institutions, but uh, as an individual, uh, what uh, traits one should develop to start their innovation journey? So if you can cover something on that. So, so, so yeah, so that, uh, that's exactly as an individual uh, wanting to innovate. I think uh, that's what we discussed earlier as well. It's all about building that curious mind. So you need to be curious. You need to find uh, 
if you're curious that is when questions will come up saying that you know how can this be done better how uh, what are the different ways of doing the same thing what is uh, what is it that i can do that will uh, change the you know uh, the landscape uh, completely so that mindset is what is most important and of course once that mindset is done i think the you you start thinking about it uh, uh you know day in and day out and even in your shower and that's when those brilliant ideas come out and uh that's when you need to as i was mentioning earlier also keep documenting keep writing it down keep dis discussing those ideas and that is when uh, you know things will uh, flower and then uh, you can actually go about building that particular product or whatever it is that your idea is Thanks. Uh, so, question to Ganesh. So, uh, how this uh, design thinking can improve the re-engineering process? So, in in our IT industry, people mostly talks about re-engineering, whether it is with respect to the processes or the business. But how design thinking will add a flavor and improve this re-engineering uh, process? Okay. Can, you know, when you talk about re-engineering, what you're talking is you might not start the project from start. Is that what you're meaning, right? Yeah. The general, yeah. general, the general notion is design thinking comes up very well only for a startup, where the company is already running. It is not possible. A product which is running is not possible. I think that's uh, it, that's a that's a wrong norm. People have got in mind. You see, it is a problem-solving technique, right? That you have a problem uh, even halfway to the project. Right, you can. That's why I said you can incrementally also apply this design thinking framework. It's not necessary that I will start from beginning and end. Might be one element of the activity can be added to the reengineering process and see how that can be improved on, and then we can do a work back. Might be you might not be able to do a complete work back, but we can see what best can be fixed within that particular area. So it is very flexible. Uh, I think uh, the, the understanding is design thinking means it takes time. It cannot be done. Uh, I think that's a wrong notion. It can be it, it can be flexible. Uh, I have done workshop for one hour. I have done workshop for four days. So <laughs> just and I worked on a lot of reengineering project as well. So it is easily possible. It's how much you want to do. Thanks, uh, Shosh. Sure. So now we had uh, just the last question, and you, I'll come uh, to both of you to get the answer for it. So we start with uh, Sandesh. So uh, now we are talking in India about our own products, our own. Uh, what i called the right word made in india kind of stuff so which products or which area you are seeing uh, which has a huge scope of innovation and uh, where india can excel it much better uh, so the, there is scope anywhere and everywhere so my, uh, i am from the financial industry from the bfsi segment so i see a lot of scope already there is so much of innovation that has happened in the payments area you can see upi basically leading but there's still scope for it to you know go uh, because of the whole COVID times can we enable uh, use cases of uh, you know contactless payments or uh, things like that so that is one area the other area that is again because of the COVID time you can see education is another sector where a lot of companies a lot of people are innovating new solutions are coming up that's another amazing area and most important area as well a good uh, potential to include more people into uh, you know uh, getting them educated and getting them uh, getting the full potential of them out the other areas of course the whole uh, concept of e-commerce now that uh, people are stopping to go to mall how do you give that mall experience for people sitting at home so uh, this is another amazing uh, opportunity to, for people to start thinking to start innovating and uh, you know in in the in the way make a lot of money as well so yeah it's not restricted to one or two areas everywhere sure. wherever you see that there is potential uh, there is scope for innovation so i think ganeshan you can cover the second half that what are the challenges you foresee uh, in this journey uh when, when, when you say challenges, can I, what, I? I don't see challenges, but what exactly you mean by challenge? Okay, so I'll, what I mean to say is like, uh, what are the kind of disruptions or what leapfrog steps India has to take for its product innovation journey? That's what. See, very simple. Uh, I think what we have to do here is uh, Ashutosh. Um, we as a, it's a, just a continue of my earlier answer, right? You cannot do end to end. You need to understand how you can apply this to situations circumstances right we may have to do piecemeal we may have to do 50 percent of this framework applicability or we may have to do 100 percent right 
there is no hard and fast rule that I need to do only this way, but it needs certain amount of process, certain amount of focus, and certain amount of consistency in getting that implemented. Our biggest problem is we start we start big. There are comp we start big and we fail, right? It's not necessary we start early and we, we, the same course and fail later, right? Because we don't continue. Consistency is important. Focus is important. And making sure that we keep the agile mode of uh, applying it again, again, and again. It could be, but one thing you're very important is I've got four activities like uh, ID8. We can't apply everywhere. So you need certain amount of expertise or guidance or consultant to tell you what can be applied where, what can be applied when, when that flexibility. So that needs a certain amount of expertise and knowledge. Otherwise, it could be a big fail. Okay. Any recommendation uh, from both of you? Uh, good reads or good websites which can be visited and understood for this in more detail. Sandesh? I, I, I would say uh, there is no one website. It is all about your area that you would want to approach. Uh, ensure that if you are looking at a particular area, you do enough study, enough research on that particular uh, area of expertise. There are enough materials on Google, on, on the first page of your Google search that you can leverage for your advantage. Uh, there are enough materials published from consulting companies. There are enough material published by research organizations. There are enough materials from universities as well. It all depends on what you want to focus on. Always focus on one area. That is my recommendation. Don't scatter yourself here, there, and everywhere. If you're focused on one area, that is when your depth of knowledge in that particular area increases, and that is when you know more better solutions or uh, you know, approaches come out. That would be my recommendation. Ganeshan, your recommendation? Yeah, uh, I think ditto what uh, Sandesh said, but I want to add one extra element here. Um, that is, uh, here, I think there's a good cross section of people who have joined as participants. There'll be designers, there could be developers, architects, and other walks of life, right? Now, uh, the point that will come to them is why design for me, right? Or why should I do design thinking? Design thinking is just not only for designers. I think that not, that thought process has to go. From a designer developer standpoint, you can look at design thinking. You're also solving a problem. You can also look at from a purchase guy or a sales guy, an HR guy. You won't believe me, I applied design thinking on my own self and it has helped me to survive in this world. So there are a lot of examples I can start giving you. You can apply it on your family. So it's, it's just one of a very interesting framework. So as Sandesh rightly put in, there's a quite a lot on the Google, but you need to know what you want to take. And initially you need some guidance. You need to have a sort of a mentor or a guide who can guide you through what you need to do. And then you've got everything on the world in Google for you to take. Can I close up with one last example, Ashutosh, if it is permitted? I feel for the entrance of audience. Am I permitted? Yeah. Yes, I, I just, I last minute, if you, I just yeah. want to take only one minute, okay? I want to share my screen just for a sure. second. Sure, 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 please. Because I feel it will benefit the audience. There is something, go to Google. A $300 million button. This button is what I want you to go through, understand how a sure button of adding a button called continue has turned the tables of this company. Please go through it and type in a $300 million button and you will understand the power of design. That's all from my side. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Saurav has asked, so at least one question has come up, so we'll take it. How does design first principles can be used in fintech domain? Uh, I think Sandesh is a Sandesh. You can answer. Sir, uh, what is the question? How does design first principles can be used in fintech domain? Uh, so design first uh, in in fintech domain. So it's not design first is not only restricted to uh, fintech domain. Essentially, design first whenever there's a consumer of a particular product. If you have a consumer, then that is when you start thinking from the consumer's perspective. And that is where what uh, Ganeshan's uh, whole session was all about. Uh, you know, uh, 
have that empathy. So that stand in, in the place of that particular customer and see how you would want to look at a particular challenge. Just as an example, payments, right? Now, uh, if you want to, uh, so you would want to do a normal transaction. For example, you would buy, want to buy medicines. You would want to uh, go fly around. You want to take a car ride to somebody uh, somewhere else. So these are the journeys of life. Now, why do you want to stop that in between for a non-critical element called payments? Why can't you make payments seamless? So as soon as you get out of the car, why can't you think of you know, money get, getting safely debited from your account? As soon as you get out of a shopping store, why don't you think why do you think you should stand in the queue to get you know uh, your uh, the checkout yes. done and payments? So that's basically putting your customers front. Uh, look at it from the customer's perspective, empathize there, and then start building the solution. So this applies for anything and everything, including fintech. I just gave an example of payments, uh, but anything, even from a lending perspective, you want to look at, even if uh, from a customer onboarding perspective, you want to look at anything and everything, uh, you can apply this simple principle of have the customer first. Sure. I think that answered it. So I think uh, now we have come to close the session. Thanks, Sandesh. Uh, thanks, Ganesh, for your insights. It was very helpful uh, for the beginners and even the guys who are working in the ground for the new product developments in the startups as well as in the organization. Thanks for insight today. And my learning uh, for the day is that user experience and empathy plays a critical role uh, when we talk about innovation management or uh, design thinking, anything. So thanks for this. And uh, we'll definitely get back to you if you get good insights uh, from the uh, from the joinees. We'll try to arrange another session where uh, we can get to learn more insights from. You. Thank you so much, and uh, have a nice day. Cool. Thanks, thanks, NPCI for uh, helping us, uh, helping the audience, and helping us convey our message to the whole audience. Thank you. Thanks, Ashutosh. Thanks, Kiran. Thanks, Anjali. And thanks, Ziba. And thanks, uh, uh, Sandesh, for joining along with me. It was a great uh, Thank you so much. A great session. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.